Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, why don't why don't we'll, we'll talk to them for a second? Okay. So, um, first of all, if you're tuned in, whether you're here through Zoom or whether you're here in person, you know if you're here in person because you can see each other. Um, right now, I believe the camera is still trained on, and that lovely, lovely, the Delavallo. Now they're the Bluegrass Trio. So did you guys? Would you guys introduce yourselves and say where you're going to school? Uh, so my name is Molly Delavalla, and I'm uh, going to Kennett. My name is Joseph Delavalla, and I'm going to Bartlett. My name is John Delavalla, and I'm going to Jackson Grammar School. And do you want to say what instruments you're playing? I'm playing the banjo. I'm playing the guitar. I'm playing the violin. Great. Banjo, guitar, and violin. And they're going to be providing some music for us through the at least the first half of the service. And then um, Alan will be doing some music from the piano later. But we really, really appreciate the Delavallas being here. Also, Allison and Autumn Varan are here. And Autumn is going to be giving us scripture this morning. We originally were building this service around our youth because we had a, a youth speaker coming who was then exposed to COVID and is now quarantining. And so wonderfully, John Gavreau, who is our guest today, uh, has agreed to do an interview. And um, this is all very spontaneous. You know, there's a hurricane threatening. So we're planning an outdoor barbecue, but everything's up for grabs and we're glad that people are here and whatever the spirit sends us we will adapt to and enjoy are there other announcements for the life of the church that we need to make this morning lori tom and cheryl's anniversary okay so I'm going to call that like prayer stuff. So we'll do prayer stuff in just a little bit. So we're going to be happy about it. And, and we're going to remind me to include it in our prayer. Um, announcements meaning kind of like schedule stuff. Are there any meetings or anything coming? I know. Next week, 8 o'clock, we're doing the historic triangle recognition. There was an, an older church built up at the corner of Wilson and Black Mountain Road. And... Uh, once a year, we remember that place, which still has a lovely, it has benches and a plaque and a wooden cross that was put up to commemorate the fact that people started their faith communities there. So at eight o'clock, we'll have an outdoor gathering there for anybody who wishes to come. That's going to be probably strictly in person. We're not going to try to pull that off on Zoom. That would be one too many things to imagine. Um, Beyond that, I don't have any other announcements for the life of the church. So why don't we now turn to yeah. Jeanette, Jeanette yeah. has one. Oh. I was going to just remind people that we're less than a month away from the um, Jen's Friends Hill Climb and the Alzheimer's Walk. Both are on September 18th. And if they need more information, they can contact me about the Alzheimer's Walk. And I don't know who about the Jen's friends. I think it's probably in the paper, online, whatever. But um, fundraisers for both of those causes, and you can participate and walk and hike in, on both of those. Good reminder. Thank you, Jeanette. And we will be trying to field a, a church team. I don't know why, but we're getting feedback. Alan's our... AV guru today. He keeps trying to help us adjust. We're getting feedback. I don't know why, Alan. Thank you. Um, it, it's my mute. Just trying to keep everybody comfortable with their ears. Any other announcements for the life of the church? When does school start? September 2nd. September 2nd. Okay, so we have another at least week of freedom. Yay. Week of freedom, love it. Now, I don't hear myself at all. Alan, I can't hear anything. Like, I don't hear, it's not coming on the speaker. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Zoom can hear us. All right, okay guys, we're good, we're good. All right, Whew, I was getting nervous. 
So now <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give it a whirl. We're gonna take a deep breath. And I invite you to arrive in this place, whether you are coming here through Zoom or whether you're here in person. Close your eyes, relax your bodies, and listen to this song offered by our lovely bluegrass trio. You're getting applause in Zoom too. You can't necessarily hear it, but there it is. So hopefully everybody feels that they have now arrived to this special morning. Now, if we have extra programs, it would be good. Can, do you guys have programs? There's one behind you on the organ bench too, if you want to grab that. I know that works. We're going to begin this morning's worship with call to worship. And this is based on a prayer from the Dalai Lama. And it's a call and response. You're the people, I'm the one. May I become at all times, both now and forever. A protector for those without protection. A guide for those who have lost their way. A shift for those a bridge for those with rivers to cross. A sanctuary for those in danger. A lamp for those without light. A place of refuge for those who lack shelter. And, and a, a servant, servant to, to all in need. And now the Delavalas will offer us again some special music. Is I think we're doing Amazing Grace now, right? Yes, yes. So if everybody wants to sing, you can sing along just like the first verse of Amazing Grace, which I'm guessing most of us know. You may know slightly different variations and it won't even matter. Um, and there's no words to put on the screen. So this is like from the heart, if you know it, go ahead and sing along. One, two.
And again, we express our appreciation. Thank you so much. I think you guys are off the hook. I don't know if you want to stay sitting there. If you're comfortable there, that's fine. If you want, you can migrate. It's up to you guys, okay? At this time in the service, we turn towards prayer. Just watch the plug right behind you. We have people stepping over wires, so we just want to be thoughtful of everybody. We turn towards the prayers that we have for the world, that we have for our community. We begin with prayers of concern, and then we will turn towards prayers of celebration because what we always find is that we need the uplift of the celebration and the gratitude to kind of guide us. If you guys turn the microphones off, then yeah. you'll, you, you won't get any feedback. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's all good. We're spontaneous. So I want to start with a few prayers that probably most people have already had on their hearts. And those would be for Haiti, for the people in Afghanistan. During a recent meeting, Northern Carroll County care providers, um, all the agencies were doing updates on what's happening. And several um, staff for our representatives here in New Hampshire, like our Congress people, were weighing in and they were saying that they were focused on um, emergency immigration, you know, a refugee status for Afghan refugees. So for, for the first time since I've been in this valley and been a part of any of these types of meetings, we were turned outward not towards what the federal government was sending into us, but how we were working outward towards providing as many chances for Afghan refugees to make it into the country as possible. So let us hold leaders in this country who are trying to respond outwardly to international crises and inwardly to the ongoing concerns of the pandemic, the fires, the floods, the huge amount of climate catastrophe that is expressing itself in so many vulnerable parts of the world. Let us continue to pray for them and where we can find ways to respond. Um, we will keep you posted if our missions team takes any action that we can recommend that if you guys want to jump on board, you're able to do. I pray also for the family of Kevin Prince. Um, he is a young father. He has a son, Cole, and a daughter, Kala. Um, here in Jackson, and he died this week. This, he was already on hospice, and he came here to give his children memories and to live the greatest quality of life that he could have for the time that remained to him with his family. And this community gave him that gift, gave his family that gift. So we hold now in our hearts their family, they will be having a service here at the church next Saturday and then a celebration of life at Black Mountain. Those are the prayers that I know about and I invite now, beginning first in this congregation, um, somewhere there's a microphone floating around. Who has the microphone? <laughs> we have a microphone that we can pass to people. So if you're here in the sanctuary and you have a prayer that you wish to raise up, you can raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone so that everyone can hear you. Um, Richard and I are heading to Dana-Farber on Wednesday for a consultation with a thoracic oncologist just to make sure hopefully we're on the right track or whether they might even have more uh, to uh, assist us trying to get rich through this, uh, this uh, unexpected um, lung cancer for a non-smoker. Other prayers here in the sanctuary of concern? Right next to you, Alan, Sasha. Continued prayers for all of the firefighters out west fighting 
an endless battle. So again, prayers for first responders out west in places like Haiti, people who have been deployed to places like Afghanistan to create some kind of stability, wherever first responders, wherever people who have chosen to serve are going, we pray for them. Other prayers here in the sanctuary. Prayers here in Zoom. If you have a prayer, please go ahead and unmute so that you can say it out loud. Looks like all's quiet in Zoom for prayers of concern. We lift up then also the many people within our community that we know are living with different kinds of diagnoses. We have folks here who are living in different parts of their journey through cancer, through Parkinson's, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes, so many different physical diagnoses or cognitive diagnoses. We have people among us who are especially struggling right now with mental health, depression, suicidality, anxiety, other types of life-altering diagnoses. And people are in different places in that journey as well. Some people are quite stable and some people are in crisis. We have people who were sober for a long time and this year has robbed them of sobriety because the ways that we cope have been challenged and people who have reclaimed their lives for so long are starting again. So in all the ways that people need light and hope and resilience, when we pray for a single body, we are praying for the body of the world. We are praying for the bodies of this community. We are praying the, for the lives of this community and other communities that through the interconnectedness of the world are part of our life too. We turn now towards prayers of celebration and gratitude and hope because this is what helps us offset the difficult news and the becoming present to what is hard in our world. And we start with Lori's prayer of Tom and Cheryl's anniversary. And we pray too for Bob Carper's birthday, his 70th birthday coming up and other prayers, go ahead. Alex's birthday, that's right, it was Friday. Are there any other birthday confessions in this room that I need to know about or in Zoom? Raise your hand if you have a birthday that I'm supposed to know about. I think there were some others that are, people are not telling me. Sue? Sorry, we're, we, we're making sure we use the microphone so everybody can hear. Yes, my friend of many, many years found the love of her life, and they got married this weekend, and I'm just so happy for her. That's wonderful. Denise. Your friend Denise. Prayers for relationships. Relationships that are coming to changes, closures, endings and beginnings. So prayers both of concern and healing and prayers of hope and renewal. Other prayers of hope or gratitude here in the sanctuary. Sasha. I would like to say that I'm so grateful that my granddaughter Mary had another successful heart operation. And I'm the most grateful that she should arrive here in a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we continue to pray for Sasha's granddaughter, Mary's heart, um, for real. And for every time that her heart remains strong or resilient and gives her more time among us, we are grateful. And for all those who choose to go into these places of caregiving, whether they are working with our elders, our partners, our parents, whether they are working in places for cancer or working in pediatric medicine or emergency medicine or mental health 
or have chosen to go out into the field to respond to crisis, we give thanks. Are there prayers of gratitude here in the sanctuary? In Zoom, any prayers that you would like to un... Go ahead, Sandy. Yes, um, I want to celebrate the gift of music of our youth. Yes, thank you. I figured somebody would do it for me. <laughs> so, for seeing two families here for the Delavala's music and for Autumn's voice, um, and the second half of the Varan family is here on Zoom. So, for the presence of different generations coming together for families that are here. Alex and Sasha are here together. Different people are still enjoying family reunions. People are going off to them. People are coming home or people are just departing again and having been here. For the chance to be present with your family in, in person while we can, such an important opportunity. And to be with our like sort of the, a more robust community when we have different generations among us, we, we give thanks. Other prayers of gratitude or hope in Zoom? All right, looks like it's quiet in there. So then I ask you to pray with me. First, we hold a moment of silence for what is happening in the world and how we call God's attention, love's attention to this place. And I call out to God, to the love that gave birth to the world that flows down through generations and fills and transforms our stories and helps us see in each other what is sacred, those we know and those we do not know. This is a world that is crying out. This is a world that knows pain, that knows suffering. It is burning. It is shivering and shaking. It is flooding, and yet this world gives us beauty. We live in a place where such beauty exists, and we are reminded that we hold care for this world in our hands as well, and that if love walks in this world, it loves and walks in our bodies, that we are the hands and the feet, the heart and the voice and the mind of love and that we do not love each other alone, but together. Because even though the Dalai Lama prayed that we should be protector, guide, ship, bridge, sanctuary, lamp, and place of refuge, or a servant to all in need, no one person can do all of this. And so we turn ourselves towards love and we ask to be guided by love. And we ask to remember that we too are the people who need to be on the bridge, in the lifeboat, on the ladder, in the place of safety, along with those to whom we reach. May we remember balance and self-care to take the Sabbath and to love ourselves along with others and to know we are never alone, should not be alone in the ways that we love each other. We ask that this remembering will be part of what we learn and carry away today. And we pray now together in the words that we have known for so long. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now if you'll bear with us, we're going to move a microphone up front to here. And then Autumn will come and read scripture for us first. And she's got three readings. The first is from Matthew 5. The second is a quote which John referred to when we were having a conversation at the end of this week. And so I put it in our readings so that you could refer to it. And we will conclude the readings with a poem by Rumi. So we're going to bring it right up on the stage if it works. Yeah. Yeah. So, Autumn, if you want to come up, but maybe come up around this way so you don't have to step over microphone cords. Okay. And so you can, you know, sort of read into this. And that's Should I take fine. Yeah, go ahead. Matthew 5 verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the light stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Well, I'm going to get out of bed every morning, breathe in and breathe out all day long. Then after a while, I won't have to remind myself to get out of bed every morning and breathe in and breathe out from Sleepless in Seattle. Be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder. Help someone's soul heal. Walk out of your house like a shepherd. Rumi. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. And I think the folks in Zoom can see us too. So that's great. And if you talk more or less into this microphone, everybody in Zoom will be able to hear you too. So this is a spontaneous interview, but John and I got together last week, well, Friday, and we chatted first just to kind of think about what was a good starting point for sharing. And I want to just say that, first of all, when it comes to letting your light shine, part of what that means for me, and I think John is demonstrating it for us today, is that it is the courage to be vulnerable. It's so easy to have a gift within you, a story or a talent or a strength, and to never use it, to hide it, to keep it locked up, but to choose to share with others is to choose to become vulnerable. And that is part of the act of courage of letting your light shine and not hiding it, which is one of the reasons that we chose this particular passage. And so just coming here today and sharing a little bit of his story with all of us is John having the courage to trust us, share his story with us, and be vulnerable. And so we thank you and we honor honor you for that. Do you wanna, is there anything you wanna start to, with or do you want me to just start asking you questions? Yeah, hear me? Yes. Oh, that's good. That's better, huh? That's better. Probably turn it on. A little oh. up. <laughs> turn it on, what? Oh, that's that one of those skills that John brings to the room. Multi-talented. Along with, along with, along with humor. <laughs> We're good, Alan. We didn't have it turned on. <laughs> okay. So, um, first of all, I want to say how I know John, which is that um, some members of this church are either founders or volunteers of the Way Station, which works with our homeless and our housing insecure population. And John is now advisory to the board. Uh, of the way station and is also one of our volunteers there and uh, and i'm also a client i've been homeless for two years so um why don't we start there what tell us just tell us what it means when you're when you say you're homeless like how are you living uh, i live out of my jeep 
I'm fortunate to have transportation. I'm fortunate enough to have the resources in the area, like the way station, uh, white horse recovery, which I'm a recovering addict. That's been a huge, um, they've uh, both been a huge help as well as, uh, the Vaughn community food, uh, food, food pantry. pantry. Yeah. And without the resources and the, the people that make up those resources, I uh, wouldn't be sitting before you today having this con you know, conversation. I'd be in a very different place. And I believe worse off. So when you, when you first found yourself living in your Jeep and homeless, you were still working. You were not sober at that I point. I was not sober initially, no. Right. No, it's about six months still of use. And so we want to acknowledge that there are many different reasons that people can become housing insecure or homeless. This is one of them. And the courage to rebuild your life when so much is gone because something like addiction has become your nemesis is one of the reasons that John is here telling us this story and even that is an act of courage. I mean, you don't just wake up and decide you're going to become sober. No, no, it's taken some time. And, you know, one of the, uh, we didn't, I didn't share this with you. I don't know if I even shared this with you at all. One of the biggest wake up calls for me is um, to get sober was uh, I lost my older brother to uh, fentanyl overdose. So for you, it's a real thing. It costs you someone you love. Yes, very real. And but you also saw there reflected your own life. Yes. And the risk for your life. So John has been working with these different agencies and putting his life back together. And now you've been sober. I've been sober a year and a half. And uh, you know, I keep continue moving forward, I do the next good thing, the next right thing. Um, and I've just completed recovery coach training um, at uh, through White Horse Recovery. Uh, not certified yet, but soon enough. Just uh, hundreds of hours more volunteer time to go for that part, but the train, he's That's on his right. way. And one of the things that I thought was remarkable about John's story is that, tell them what you did before, before all this. What was your job? Uh, I was an auto mechanic, automotive and antique boat restoration. Yeah. And a, and a carpenter at one point, <laughs> so mostly physical labor. And so I was intrigued by your initial thoughts about recovery coach training and how you pivoted towards it. So- yeah. Yeah, originally John was thinking it wasn't a good fit. Yeah, I just so completely removed from what I had done before. I'm used to being, a, you know, not in a public setting, not dealing with the public, just me and some wrenches in a car or, or boat. And that's about it. And I was happy there, quite happy. Um, but unfortunately, my physical health deteriorated and that left me unable to do that type of work anymore. So now transitioning in, I still, this didn't, you know, I've, you told me I was going to do this a year ago. I would have thought you were, you know, pulling my chain. Yeah, you didn't see yourself working with people mm. um, in a caring role, really. Yes, yeah, but yeah, especially in that role. Yeah, John's an introvert. In case anybody hasn't picked that up yet, right? <laughs> so for him to sit here and and tell a story, or to even imagine himself becoming a recovery coach, I think both of those are amazing transformations, and it's part of this you know, let your light shine, this vulnerability, I mean, what it takes, how different you are when you, when you wake up the way you wake up and, and what's important to you. Well, in the past few months, I mean, when I wake up, I'm, I'm not merely just sitting in a parking lot that I slept in at night. I mean, I'm looking out at the White Mountains and I'm looking forward into the future instead of not being able to see the road, you know, in front of my face. Yeah. And so John was saying that about three or four months ago, uh, up until then, you were feeling a lot of despair still, and that things seemed to sort of fall into place. And I, we, couldn't, we couldn't lay our finger on one specific thing, but many things sort of came together. And 
you started following this path. Yeah, and you know, being you know asked to be a part of the community, um, you know, as a asked asked to uh, approach to being a volunteer, um, which we had talked about before, but I don't think I had much drive for it. I was still like really in the throes of despair at that point, and um, you know, being treated like a you know eye to eye by everyone in the community is that you don't always it's not always society that imposes um, their opinion on you and puts you down if you're in a, a certain situation or live a certain way. We learn to treat ourselves in that manner by what we see, how we see society treat others. And so you feel like that, that voice, that editorial voice and that self-criticism was really rampant in your life for quite a while. Oh, quite, yeah. It was all. It was all that I knew at times, and it's all that I've known at times through all my whole life, no matter what the situation. But more apparently so in in homelessness. And yet somehow, I mean, because John's not not homeless. John is still living in his jeep. But again, it's the next thing you do, and it's the waking up and having a sense of purpose and connection every day, in and, part. And having a sense of you know. So some sense of normalcy, I wake up and I make my coffee every morning. And, uh, you know, at first that, you know, it's not something I wanted to do. Now it's something I look forward to. It's something I'm very grateful for being able to do. I have a lot, I have a lot to be grateful for and realize that, you know, wh whatever troubles we, we have, whatever we're going through, they're all relative to our situation and no one's problems outweigh another's. Sometimes people stumble a little bit more than others and we can give a hand, but. And so you, you even mentioned that there are days when you still wake up and you don't want to go through the motions of making the coffee or taking a, a sponge bath and, you know, like, but you do. Right. Yeah. Even though it, you know, it feels like the last thing I want to do, I go through it anyway. And um, hopefully it'll lead me to a, you know, a good place. Uh, I was sharing the part about making coffee with some friends and one of them said, oh, it reminds me of when David and Ginger talk about how in the military they teach you to make your bed mm. because it's the detail and it's the getting up and doing something the same way and doing it well and caring enough and just going through that motion. But it becomes, if you think about it, the way you take care of yourself and having something that you can count on that gives you, you were talking about, it gives you a rhythm to your day and a schedule. Mm. So you could, imp you could give time some sense of meaning. It becomes a spiritual practice, right? We all have different spiritual practices. Maybe some people go walk the dog. Some people say a prayer, or meditate. Some people pick up their instrument and they practice it. And for John, one of the things that is a, a self-care practice, but I think also a way of connecting himself to a larger tradition of being human um, and mattering is to make a cup of coffee with a French press, no less. It's not just, it's a, it's a good, good cup of coffee for coffee people. Um, say what you think about what the future is for you. I, do, I don't, I have high hopes for the future and I, I have reason to, behind those hopes now. And when I look forward, it's kind of like looking through the fog. I don't really, I don't necessarily know what is there. I can't make up the shape of it, but I know it's there. And I just keep waking up and making my coffee and making a step or looking in that direction. Right, because for instance, like recovery coach training has, it's not just one layer. There are a lot of possibilities even with that kind of and, and it is multifaceted and it's not, there's many more pathways when initially looking at it from, from just a client perspective, it looked like there was one pathway to take. And you, you know, you start he, as a recovery coach and you end up as a 
licensed drug and alcohol counselor, but there's, there's many pathways throughout that. Um, then I'm interested to see where I end up. And, and I think part of the interesting thing that I learned in our conversation was what used to be important to you and what's important to you now. So like 10 years ago, how you measured your life and what was important to you and, and what, you know, like uh, it was stuff. Yeah, it was stuff. It was things, money, you know. Um, cars. Yeah, cars, a house, all, I've had it all. And um, I was thinking about that this morning. And um, I've been in deeper despair with every with everything you could think of than when I was in my truck this morning drinking my coffee. So in a sense, it doesn't mean that a simple life is a better life, but sometimes the experience of losing so much and having to begin again just changes your focus and your perspective about what's important. So what do you think is important now for you? Uh, community connection, uh, my sobriety, uh, uh, helping others helps me see outside my situation. Um, and a holistic approach to, you know, how, uh, how I eat and my, you know, my new, my diet, I'm uh, vegan now. And, um, that's changed how I feel even in the slightest way. John shared that he's lost 50 pounds. He lost one pound a day for the first month when he started changing how he was eating and because of his physical fitness exercise is a harder thing for him to reach for but even it doesn't matter whether you're homeless or homes there can be ways that you can do your best to take care of yourself and that's been huge for you yeah self-care has been been you know centrally important to me mm -hmm. and everything else seems to come along with after the self-care yeah. i mean if you feel better it's it's more possible to i mean you're feeding your body you're feeding your brain you can look at the world differently. It helps boost mm. your, your mood, your, your reserves, your resilience. Um, and it's just, I think it's a really striking lesson among others. And so I want to just read again the, um, the quote from Sleepless in Seattle, Thank you. Uh, which actually, John, do you want to read it? The one in the middle. Well, I'm going to get out of bed of every morning, breathe in and out all day long. Then after a while, I won't have to remind myself to get out of bed every morning and breathe in and out. Thank you. Thank you. For John, that was sort of the, it was a good summary for where he is right now in his life. And um, so let's just sort of conclude with this idea too, that to have the courage to let your light shine when you don't know precisely what's coming next, when you're still in that place of like the fog or the uncertainty, that's a very uncomfortable place for humans to be. We like to have a plan. We like to know what's coming next. We like to have goals. It's so uncomfortable to have to live day by day, breath by breath, the next right thing to the next right thing. And yet, has not our entire nation and in our entire world been challenged so often in the last year and a half to live this way? Uh, we can. It's not always the best or the only way, but it is an important thing for us to know that we can be okay in the uncertainty and we don't have to turn off our light in the middle of all that. In fact, that's when we need to be each other's light the most. And so people in this valley have been light for John and John is light for others. So let us give thanks for the light within us, for the times when someone else rekindles that light, when we feel our light has gone out and that we know we're not the only light. There is a sky full of light. There is a world full of light. Each person in this room, each person gathered in Zoom, all the people that you know who are reaching out to each other and helping each other and those who 
you see who also require your help, even if you're just bearing witness to their life and saying they matter by, you said, you know, when you see somebody that could be homeless, you maybe can't recognize whether someone's homeless or not, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat somebody else as a human being. You are being the light in the world. Anything else you want us to know? Uh, no, I think that's, that wraps it up nicely. All right, then. With that, we give thanks for John's gift of his time and his presence. There's a barbecue, so stick around for the barbecue. So far, it's not a hurricane outside just yet, so I think we might still be able to eat out there. And we are going to conclude with um, a song and a benediction. So watch the step and you can. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys want to. So before we begin the hymn, let's just remember that one of the ways that this church is able to be a light is that you all are a light and that your giving helps us to be partners with other churches, other nonprofits, to whether we're reaching out to Haiti or Afghanistan or we're reaching inward right here into our own valley. Your giving, your commitment, whether you give by jxncc.org or tuck money in an envelope or mail it in or whatever. We thank you because it helps us be a light. And so I believe we can now safely turn to, we picked a song we figured everybody would know that seems highly relevant to today's conversation. This little light of mine so if you're able, please rise for this song, and you'll find it on page 364 in the red hymnal. And the light, uh, yeah, I'm so, go ahead. Go ahead, Ellen.
brothers and sisters, go with light in your hearts and peace on your tongues. Go with love into the world. Go in peace. Thank you.